And there's a lot more tonight on the growing clash between the worlds of politics and sports in this football Sunday. You know, players across the NFL in a show of defiance against President Trump after he called on fans to express their disapproval of players who kneel during the national anthem, as you can see. But in some cases, that defiance can work both ways. Take a look at this man. He is Pittsburgh Steel uh, Millers. While his team was in the locker room as the anthem played, he stayed outside standing up while the anthem was playing. He did not stay in the locker room. Of course, he is a veteran. He is an Army Ranger. He is a West Point graduate. He also has earned the Bronze Star. He is offensive ta tackle Alejandro Villanueva. And he stood during the national anthem while that was being played today in uh, the game with Pittsburgh. Will there be more? Hello, I'm Eric Sean, and this is a new hour of America's News Headquarters. Hello, Eric, and hello, everyone. I'm Arthel Neville. Well, this all started on Friday night in a big college football state, Alabama, during a campaign rally for Republican Senate runoff candidate Luther Strange, where the president urged NFL owners to fire players who kneel during the national anthem. Now, the country's most popular sport has become the latest political flashpoint. We have Fox team coverage. Marianne Rafferty is standing by on the the West Coast as a slate of games there are still underway. But we begin with Kristen Fisher. She's in Somerset, New Jersey, near the president's golf club where he spent the weekend. Hi, Kristen. Hey, Arthel. Well, we've been hearing from President Trump all weekend long on Twitter. Now we're hearing from him in person twice in the last hour, to be exact. And he told reporters that he's been watching the games. He was watching some of the protests. And they asked him if he thought that he was perhaps inflaming racial tensions by making all of these comments. And here's what he said. No, this has nothing to do with race. I've never said anything about race. This has nothing to do with race or anything else. This has to do with respect for our country and respect for our flag. So he says this has nothing to do with race and everything to do with respect for our flag and our country. That statement's really just now hitting social media, so just give it a few more minutes. I'm sure it's going to be praised and condemned. And that's what happens on social media, right? So uh, this morning, two administration officials hit the Sunday shows to back up President Trump, the Treasury Secretary, and the White House Director of Legislative Affairs, Mark Short. And he equated this latest controversy to high school football players who are punished for uh, leading their players in prayers before a game. Listen. They're getting punished and disciplined for asking their players to prayer. Yet in the NFL, players who take a knee over a flag that many of our generations preceding us have died to protect the freedoms there. They somehow get um, honored as martyrs by the media. The president is pointing out that that shouldn't be accepted. They have a First Amendment right to do that, but NFL owners also have a right to fire those players. And so this is all happening just one day after President Trump rescinded his invitation for Golden State Warriors guard Steph Curry to visit the White House after winning the NBA championship. Now the entire team isn't going, but the hockey team that just won the Stanley Cup, well, they're taking a different approach. The Pittsburgh Penguins put out a statement this morning that reads, quote, the Penguins respect the institution of the office of the president and the long tradition of championship teams visiting the White House. Any agreement or disagreement with a president's politics, policies or agenda can be expressed in other ways. So uh, we're really seeing this controversy spreading to different sports. We're seeing different teams take different tactics. But don't forget, Eric and Arthel, this is all taking place uh, at the beginning of a very big week for this administration. You've got the effort to repeal and replace Obamacare for, what is this, I think the third time, pulling uh, out tax reform. You have all these ongoing hurricane recovery efforts. North Korea, and don't forget, tonight, uh, President Trump's travel ban is set to expire, so we could be getting more recommendations about that any minute now. Yeah, FL? we're waiting for that, of course, and if we get it, I know you'll get it to us, and we'll have it here. He has a lot on his plate, he being President Trump, and we're watching it all. Thank you, Kristen. Sure thing. Well, meanwhile, NFL players and coaches, well, some are divided over how to exactly respond to comments about firing players who don't stand during the national anthem. Take a look to this controversy where you are. Well, we talked to several uh, fans here at the Chiefs Chargers game, and they all seem to agree that they're not going to stop coming to games, but some agree with the players' right to protest, and others just do not. I voted for Trump. 
And I'm a big Trump supporter. What he's doing now, it's crossing the line. It's getting a little too personal. Players locking arms and standing together in unity at games across the country. 100 players taking a knee at the Tennessee Titans Seattle Seahawks game. Both teams staying in the locker room, some teams choosing to do so to avoid controversy, but the Seahawks statement saying in part, we will not stand for the injustice that has plagued people of color in this country out of love for our country and in honor of the sacrifices made on our behalf oppose those who would deny our basic freedoms. Now, this all started with President Trump on, on Friday suggesting at a political rally in Alabama that players who take a knee should be fired. Get that son of a off the field right now. Out. He's fired. He's fired. Now, again, uh, so far, league executives have come out mostly in support of the players uh, supporting their right to protest. But as you saw, many of them standing, locking arms, still saying, hey, we're all together. We're united uh, for this cause, uh, but not taking a knee during the anthem. As far as the fans, they packed them in here at the Chiefs Chargers game. And uh, so many of those fans saying that, that they're going to keep coming. They're going to keep watching on TV. Eric. All right, Marianne. Thanks so much. And Eric, another big story of the day, the Republican effort to repeal and replace Obamacare could be on shaky ground. GOP lawmakers are trying to win over at least two potential holdouts, Senator Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. And the bill is steeper climb with Senator Ted Cruz saying that he opposes the bill, at least for now, all of this after Senator John McCain said he cannot vote for it. Ellison Barber has more now from Washington. Ellison? Two possible blows to the Graham-Cassidy health care bill coming from Senator in Texas and Maine's Susan Collins. Collins is a key senator in all of this, and the White House has spent a lot of time trying to convince her to support the Graham-Cassidy bill. Today, she said she is most likely not going to support it. It's very difficult for me to envision a scenario, a scenario where I would end up for this bill. Republicans lose three of their own senators. The bill fails. There's no Democrat support for it. All 48 Democrats oppose. And we need to make sure that those last couple Republicans we went over. Those Republicans, of course, as you know, are John McCain, Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, and Rand Paul. That's our path to victory. And Cruz added his name to that list of people needing conviction sorry, in so Texas. So you're not necessarily against. So, so look, right now, yeah. they don't have my vote, and I don't think they have Mike Lee's either. No word on how Alaska's Lisa Murkowski will vote. Vain says he will not vote for this legislation. Senator Rand Paul has said the same. White House Legislative Director Mark Short told Fox News Sunday there will not be major changes. I don't think there's significant changes, Chris. We have been continuing to talk to various centers, not just Collins and Murkowski, but ways to refine the formula. Because what we're actually doing, as you know, is we're taking dollars out of one out to the states. The deadline for this is September 30th. Right now, Republicans only only need 50 yes votes, a simple majority, to pass this legislation. Come October, they need 60. Arthel? Okay, Ellison Barber, thank you. Eric? Well, meanwhile, Puerto Rico, well, it's still recovering from that horrible damage caused by Hurricane Maria. Officials there are now keeping a very close eye on a failing dam that's near San Juan. They say it's threatening to collapse in the flooding. And thousands of people downstream from that dam have been ordered to evacuate. And still, after days later, the entire island remains without power. It's pretty orderly, uh, kind of calm, and people are doing the very best they can with resolve and, and, and resistance. Hi, Garrett. Well, Eric, uh, that area in western Puerto Rico has received more rain today, and this weather service extended a flash flood warning for that area until 8.15 tonight. Now, 8,000 people have already been evacuated downstream from the Guajataca Dam, and that area is still a concern for officials. They say it could still break at any moment, but earlier today, there were still folks that were returning to their homes in that area simply because water there on the reservoir had dropped down and they said they wanted to get home despite the threat that remains. Now, the greatest needs across the island remain 
food, water, and fuel. And throughout the day, volunteer organizations such as the International Red Cross and others have been slowly arriving here on the island with supplies, uh, along with FEMA, with thousands of gallons of water and meals here for the folks. And uh, this is going to be an ongoing process over the next days and weeks. Now, the governor today, he said no, the full extent of the damage in Puerto Rico simply because, as you mentioned, the communications are down across the entire country. So a lot of these small towns across the country, the far east and the far south, some of the hardest hit parts of the storm, they haven't heard from those areas on what the full extent of the damage is because a lot of the leaders there haven't been able to get out and see it for themselves. FEMA is trying to help with that. They're getting satellite phones to the local leaders in every town across the country, or rather across uh, the territory, and they are trying to get that communication up and going, but it'd be as long as six months before the power grid is up and running. We know AT&T has been sending some crews down to Puerto Rico from uh, Jacksonville, Florida, to help begin that process of, of getting the cell towers up and running again, because uh, that has been one of the greatest struggles for folks here, is not being able to communicate with their loved ones back home and back in the States as well, just to let them know, hey, I'm here, I'm doing okay, we are all right. And uh, folks driving as far as 40, 50 miles searching for a cell phone signal just to get that message back home. And as soon as they see that signal bar show up on their phone, they'll stop anywhere along the highway. Long stretches, we'll have long lines of cars because that is the only place that the cell phone signal has been. Folks will stop there to make that phone call just to let them know. A very long road for recovery ahead here in Puerto Rico, Eric. And that is so crucial to uh, reach your loved ones like that. And, and it's, it's so beyond belief that it's gonna take so long for that island to recover, but it will. Uh, Garrett, thanks so much. Arthel? And Eric, from Puerto Rico to Mexico, where the search is on for more survivors in Mexico City, almost a week after an earthquake rumbled through the central part of that country, why rescuers there are not giving up hope. Plus, the U.S. military taking some bold action to show North Korea its strength. Those stories coming up. Point one earthquake rocked Mexico City. And rescue crews tonight are still desperately searching for survivors, even as more quakes have uh, shaken that region. And they're right now past that 96-hour estimate time for survival, but it hasn't stopped them from having hope. Jonathan Hunt, live tonight for us in Mexico City. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, Eric, this is the last remaining official search and rescue operation. This a search of a collapsed office building in downtown Mexico City's Roma neighborhood. Now, take a look at the rescue workers who are up there, dozens of them, as you can plainly see, and the painstaking nature of the work they are doing, Eric. As I say, that is six stories pancaked down onto each other. And because of the chance, however remote, that there might still be somebody alive in that rubble. They're not using any heavy machinery. They are moving each piece of rubble essentially by hand. It is a long task. It is a difficult task. It is a dangerous task. And just a couple of hours ago, all of those rescue workers you see there suddenly moved off of that pile of rubble. Apparently, it had been shifting dangerously beneath them. And because of the danger of any of them losing their lives, they moved away until they could be sure it was safe to come back on again. And then as you come back down here, you can see right in front of me uh, a kind of tent city. These tents have all been set up for the families of those who are still missing. It is a desperately heartbreaking scene as you watch these, as we have done all day, Eric's people who uh, periodically just break down in tears, not because they've got any news, but precisely because they still don't have any news about their missing loved ones. They are determined to stay here until they do get that news. And those rescue workers on top of that pile of rubble are determined to stay here. They are not giving up yet. Eric, everyone hopes to may yet be a miraculous discovery of somebody still alive lie beneath the rubble and one veteran U.S. Uh, rescue worker talked to me about that and he said 
Yes, that 96 hours mark is what we often look at, but I was in Haiti, he said, back in 2010, and we found people alive between seven and nine days after that earthquake hit. So there is still a tiny sliver of hope tonight. Eric? You can always pray for miracles and certainly uh, admire the determination and resilience of those rescue teams who are not giving up. Jonathan Hunt tonight, thank you, in Mexico City. Arthel. And now to the tensions continuing to escalate with North Korea with tough talk from both sides and as a show of force, the Pentagon sending a squad of eight U.S. fighters and bombers to the farthest point north of the demilitarized zone by any such American aircraft this century. They flew in international waters to the east of North Korea. This coming after North Korea's Foreign Minister Ri Young-ho delivered a fiery speech at the United Nations yesterday, harshly slamming President Trump as mentally deranged and saying Mr. Trump's tough talk on North Korea is making a strike against the U.S. mainland, he said, quote, inevitable. President Trump taking to Twitter, basically warning the North that it will cease to exist if it attacks the U.S. Colorado Republican Senator Cory Gardner, a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, also weighing in on the growing showdown. Our number one goal with North Korea, as it relates to North Korea, must and always will be peaceful denuclearization of the North Korean regime. We will stand to protect our great allies, South Korea and Japan, protect the U.S. homeland. But we have a lot of work to do on the diplomatic and, diplomatic and economic side before we think of any other option. Joining me now is Harold Kazianis. He is the Director of Defense Studies at the Center for National Interest. Uh, may I call you Harold? Hi, Harold. Sure, absolutely. Uh, okay, very good. So let's get here. How do you assess, Harold, this war of words between President Trump versus Kim Jong-un? And will it cause Kim Jong-un to stand down or does it close the window of opportunity for a diplomatic solution? Arthur, I, I don't think Kim Jong-un is going to stand down at all, to be honest with you. The, the challenge here is very simple. The North Koreans are in a little bit of a bind. They want to develop a nuclear capability and a missile capability to be able to hit the United States homeland with atomic weapons. To do that, they have to test those weapons. And with the war of words between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, I think Kim Jong-un is going to realize that he needs to test probably the ultimate weapon, which is an intercontinental ballistic missile. I think in the next 24 hours, really starting maybe right now, up until maybe 72 hours, they will fire one of these intercontinental ballistic missiles. Tough to know where it's going to go. There's been a lot of talk about maybe into the South Pacific, maybe even off the coast of California, that's possible. But I think that's where this goes next. Does that bother you? It frightens, it frightens the you-know-what out of me, to be honest with you. But my big fear is, is that the North Koreans would actually put a nuclear warhead on the end of that missile and do an atmospheric test. Now, in that situation, I don't think there's any way that they would do it off the coast of California. But if they wanted to test the full range of their ICBM, the South Pacific is actually perfect because that's about 10,000 kilometers from North Korea. It's in a, in a somewhat isolated area. There are islands there like Cook Island that have decently large populations about 20,000 people, but it would still put nuclear and, and radioactive fallout into the atmosphere. And that's horrific. That's something nobody should do anymore. Uh, let's take this from the geopolitical perspective. Chancellor Angela Merkel re-elected as the leader of Germany. So this, does this verbal volley between uh, President Trump and Pyongyang position Merkel more of a prominent leader on the world stage? I mean, I think to a certain extent, I think Merkel's number one concerns are for what's happening in the European Union with all the various migrant issues, migrants coming in from Syria, challenges with Islamic terrorism. So I think Merkel's number one sort of geopolitical focal point is going to be handling what's happening in Europe. I know she's had some negative comments against the president for some of his handling with the North Korea crisis, but I have a feeling that it's going to be the United States, Japan and South Korea that are really going to be leading the charge when it comes to North Korea. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Just wondering in terms of just uh, optics, if she seems to be more measured only in this particular face where the president is getting in, in the gutter in a way uh, with in this Twitter war with uh, Kim Jong-un. But let's move on because the White House is imposing more sanctions on foreign banks and businesses uh, that are conducting trade with North Korea. As you know, Harold, China is limiting oil exports to North Korea, cutting back on imports from North Korea. And, you know, such moves can choke Kim Jong-un's budget, but he's still doing business with Russia. But 
might these stepped up measures by China finally squeeze Kim Jong-un enough to make him stop it with the nuclear test and building of nukes? Or does this sort of make him react like a cat with its back against the wall? Back against the wall. Well, I, I think in the short term, I think the North Koreans are going to still have the capability to test missiles, test nuclear weapons. The, the, the sanctions aren't going to stop that in the short term. To long, Chinese are the key in this whole thing. The, the, the Chinese have supported now nine different United Nations Security Council resolutions over a decade. The challenge here, they've never heard of them. So uh, while I see the, the actions by the Chinese, I, I, I'm very hopeful that this will be the time they will actually enforce the sanctions. But if we know one thing here, the great weakness of the North Koreans is their economy. It's only worth $14 billion. They're, they're this tiny, tiny economy that's trying to build. We can close that economy, build out their nuclear weapons program anymore. That's what we need to focus on. Harold Kazianis, I have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Eric. We know there are lots of NFL players. Well, they did take to their knee today when the national anthem was played at the beginning of their games. That, of course, in defiance of the president saying they should be fired for these protests. President Trump also saying fans should boycott games if the players are not booted. So, what are the fans saying? We'll have their views and what could happen next, straight ahead. President Trump's condemnation of NFL players who kneel during the national anthem is dividing fans on this issue. Dozens of Jaguars and Ravens players took a knee before their game in London today. But others, like all members of the New York Jets, stood proudly during the national anthem. Brian Yennis is in East Rutherford, New Jersey, where the Jets beat the Miami Dolphins. And I understand you have new information, new word from the president. Right, Brian? Yeah, Arthel, we'll, we will get right to the president's words. But first, uh, you know, we've been speaking to folks here right outside of MetLife Stadium where the Jets did beat the Dolphins here right outside MetLife in New Jersey. And I want to tell you, for the most part, most people don't agree with the form of protest. They'd rather not see people kneel for the national anthem. We spoke to about two dozen people. But when it comes to whether or not they're willing to boycott this sport that they love so much, yeah, we didn't find any of that. Take a listen. I don't believe it's a good thing. I believe uh, some of us here... Actually, a few of us here were in the military, and uh, I just don't think it's the right place. No, I, I'm not going to boycott the NFL at all. What's, what are your thoughts? Why, actually? Tell well, me. Why? Because, because I understand people have the right to protest, right? But you protest against a specific action. If you are going to protest for Black Lives Matter, right, march in a Black Lives Matter, right? If you're going to protest specifically, but they'll do it at a sporting event. I just think it's the wrong venue. I would never boycott the NFL because I love football, um, but I think the, the president should have interjected in it. I think that our, that our young men and women fought for us to have the right to either stand up or take that knee. It's just, you know, what we believe in. If it's a, a way for us to get the message across um, in terms of what they're fighting for, um, why not? You know, you just have to support them no matter what. Can we just have our Sundays with football? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Let's <laughs> He's just messing that up now. No, just like, yeah. look, look, I'm having a beer. I'm trying to enjoy, you know, Sunday with my wife. We, we're yeah. diehard Jeff fans and we're talking about politics now. Yeah. It's just like, it's just too much. Thought. I would have thought. At least yeah. I want to drink more. And well, just 10 minutes ago, Donald Trump, the president, tweeting again on the subject, saying, quote, sports fans should never condone players that do not stand proud for the national anthem or their country. NFL should change policy. I can tell you, Arthel, post the games here, the number one topic is not whether or not people should stand or kneel. It's whether or not their team won. And luckily here for the Jets, they won, so people were happy for the most part. Giants did not do so well, but it mixed bag on that front. Arthel. Yeah, okay, Brian Yannis. Thank you. <laughs> Eric? Yep. Well, at least the Jets won. For more on this, sportscaster Fox News contributor Jim Gray uh, joins us now. Jim, how damaging do you think this is to the game? Well, it's just damaging to the national fabric and the fraying of it. Now we have people who have to make a decision. Mike Tomlin, the head coach of the Steelers, said today that he did not put his team out for the national anthem because he didn't want to have to make his guys decide which side to go on. Charles Woodson, a great cornerback in the NFL, uh, said today that it's time to pick sides. Well, 
you know, where will our common experiences be? Where will we share the common good of society if we can't share it at sports anymore? I mean, when you look back at social change, uh, we've had in a lot of instances, uh, Tom, Tommy Smith and John Carlos back in the 68 Olympics and Muhammad Ali's career, but never have we seen a league, an institution galvanized like the NFL players and owners did today, virtually in unison, the way that they turned out in their support of giving these players the right to do this. You mentioned their support, and we saw about 100 players or so who were kneeling, but uh, you just mentioned uh, the Steelers. Uh, the coach told them to stay in the locker room. I uh, didn't want to be a part of this because politics is not a part of sports, but one member of the Steelers, the offensive tackle, Alejandro Villanueva, you see him there. He was the lone member who stood by the tunnel with his hand over his heart. He went to West Point. He's an Army Ranger. He won the Bronze Star. He was in Afghanistan three times. Uh, he helped save lives of his fellow servicemen when he was under fire. Uh, and that, in, in some ways, some would say he's giving the, the opposite message. Uh, you know, how widespread do you think that is in, in the whole league, or is he in the minority? Well, he's been in the minority, at least today. I mean, Derek Wolf uh, spoke out for the Denver Broncos uh, in, in support, basically, of what President Trump has said. Uh, but, you know, players are fighting for social justice and they're using their platform and their voice. So what they feel is a fight for social justice. A lot of the average people in this country, a lot of the people who are fans feel that it's disrespectful to the country and disrespectful to the flag. And that's the gap. About 70 percent of the people going into today, Eric, there hadn't been a poll taken, obviously, because of these recent events were against players kneeling, so that's the divide. Yeah, the president, when he arrived back in Washington tonight, said that he's not calling for a boycott. Uh, not, but a little different maybe than what he had said before. But he also said that the players had rights. He did concede that, but he said basically when you're on the field, he says he wants them to respect uh, the country. They should respect the flag, he said. He also had some comments about Bob Kraft, his friend. You know, Kraft, owner of the Patriots, uh, was a big donor to uh, President Trump. They're there at the White House uh, with the Super Bowl trophies. Uh, let me read you Kraft's statement, and then we'll show you what the president said today about him. Mr. Kraft, about all this, said, quote, I am deeply disappointed by the tone of the comments made by the president. I think our political leaders should learn a lot from the lessons of teamwork and the importance of working together toward a common goal. Our players are intelligent, thoughtful, and care deeply about our community, and I support their right to peacefully affect social change and raise awareness in a manner that they feel is most impactful. And here is the president uh, before he left New Jersey, heading back to the White House, talking about his friend Bob Kraft. Well, that's okay. Look, he's got to take his... He, got, he has to take his ideas and go with what he wants. I think it's very disrespectful to our country. I think it's very, very disrespectful to our flag. So what, you know, what does Bob Kraft and the other owners do tomorrow and when they have to face this next Sunday? Well, 20 owners came out in support of Unison and not the divisive nature of what they felt the president's comments were. We now have players who are tweeting and commenting on the president of the United States is something I've never seen in our life before. LaShawn McCoy of the Buffalo Bills I used an expletive after the game describing the president. Yesterday, LeBron James called President Trump a bum. We've never seen anything like this. So, you know, sports is a mirror into the soul of our society, and, and it reflects the, the, the mood of the country. I mean, look back at what the 1980 Miracle Team on Ice did back in Lake Placid when they beat the Soviets. And look back at the 72 Olympic game of basketball when we lost to the Soviets after the referees cheated. This is the soul of America. We unite around sports. And so this isn't good for anybody. I mean, to those military veterans and to the people who have defended the flag, they're very offended and rightfully so. But to those who have this podium and want to see social change, they feel this is the platform that they should be able to use. And they have that right, so they're doing it. And we look back to the history of sports of Jackie Robinson and, and everything else. Uh, Jim Gray, thank you for your insight. We always deeply appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. And Eric and Jim, President Trump expected to announce new restrictions on his travel ban at any time now. Will they pass muster in the courts? Our legal panel with a closer look up next. As we've been reporting, President Trump is expected to announce new restrictions on his travel ban any time now. As the current ban on foreign nationals from six Muslim-majority countries expires today, that's 90 days after it took effect. 
Officials haven't said which or how many countries will be affected by the new restrictions, which could take effect again as soon as tonight. And when that we get the details, of course, we'll bring it to you right here on Fox News. Meanwhile, we'll talk about what we do know. Let's bring in our legal panel to discuss it. Mercedes Cohen is a Fox News legal analyst. And Rachel Self is a trial attorney and specialist in immigration and criminal defense law. Okay, very good panel. Uh, Mercedes, I'm going to start sure. with you on this one. From what we do know, will this latest version be more legally acceptable? Also, where are the potential roadblocks? Well, it seems clear that it's already been established that the president has significant power when it comes to ensuring that this country is safe by excluding certain aliens from coming into the country. So we already established that. We have the immigration laws that establish that clearly. Where some of the roadblocks would be was certainly with this, this whole notion that this was a Muslim ban. But when you think about the countries that are not on this list, and I've got it right here, we have Afghanistan that's 99% Muslim with 40, with 29 million Muslims. We have Bangladesh that's 98% Muslim with 149 Muslims. There's so many countries that are not on that list. What the executive branch has to do is to look at other countries that perhaps don't have a Muslim majority but yet pose a threat to the United States and put them on that list. That way it can eliminate what's really been couched as a Muslim ban, but rather this is a ban that the president has the power to enforce. He has the immigration laws behind him and certainly want to keep the America safe. Rachel, how do you see it? Well, I think initially it was very clear that it was a Muslim ban, and he himself had come out and said that it was a Muslim ban. And then he had a very steep learning curve on what checks and balances are in this country. And so the courts stepped in, lawyers stepped in, the ACLU stepped in and said, no, Mr. President, you're not allowed to violate people's Bill of Rights protections and couch it in protecting the country, because if you're violating the Bill of Rights protections, you're breaking the law. And so at this point, I think that he has learned a lot. There's been a lot of preparation in preparing new orders when this order expires. And I think that with all of the guidance he's receiving, he's going to be able to avoid some of those pitfalls if he wants to do so. And I think that really the grand scheme here is to protect America. And it seems as though that um, in this present iteration that seems to be coming down, and again, there's a lot that we don't know, but in this present iteration, it appears there are nine countries that may be on the list, one of which is not a Muslim majority country. So of course, legally, it'll be a lot harder to make an argument that he's targeting people that's violative of constitutional protections. Also, he's not going to be going after present visa holders in this particular iteration. It's going to be for prospective applicants, which also, if those applicants aren't able to show a bona fide tie to the United States, that he'll have a very strong argument and will have a very strong argument to prevent them from traveling here. I think that he's going to be a lot smarter this time around. He's getting a lot more guidance this time around, and hopefully we won't wind up with the same problems we had last time around. And meanwhile, Mercedes, how does this affect the existing litigation over the first and second versions of the president's uh, travel ban. Well, so much could be mooted out. It really depends on what this new iteration is going to do. It could be mooted out completely, and then the courts won't have anything to really discuss. The whole issue is whether this is a Muslim ban, therefore discriminatory. That's the that's the essence of it. If what the executive branch can show is that there was a legitimate reasons for the exclusion of these countries, that these are countries that did not abide by the extreme vetting that's necessary to keep America safe. If you have the, the fact that some of these individuals that are that are trying to seek entry into the United States have terrorist background, have a criminal background, have some tie, don't have bona fide right. ties to those here in the United States. Those are all things that are going to be considered. And frankly, when you bundle it all together and show the court that you have a legitimate basis for what you are doing at the executive branch and you have the laws to un under underline it all, then certainly they could moot it out in the court. Well, we will find out soon once the president uh, releases the details of his new version of that travel ban. I have to leave it there. Rachel Self, Mercedes Cohen, thanks to both of you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Great to be on. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you guys. Same here. Thank you. Well, you know, a battle splitting the Republican Party in Alabama is right now playing out. It pits Judge Roy Moore against Senator Luther Strange. We'll have a live report on this tightly contested runoff as it goes down to the wire.